Right, so, yes, thanks very much, Nils, for this very far too kind introduction. And um, thanks, everybody, for being here. And I should also congratulate the University of Aarhus for having come up with this wonderful idea of having a series of futures lectures. I mean, we should do something similar in Oslo, but obviously we can't do the same thing. We have to think of something else, which is nearly as good. So, so I'm, I'm very happy to be here. And, and as I was going to say, I mean, you'll notice, but uh, Nils already said it, you'll notice that I speak fast. Uh, and I suppose I should apologize for that, but I don't think I will, because so do you. You speak fast as well. Probably more than 50% faster than your grandparents did. And this is not just something I'm making up. I mean, we have measurements which indicate that the speed of speech in our part of the world has accelerated quite dramatically since the Second World War. So if I were to choose just one word, if I were given just one word to describe the current era, now we can discuss when the current era is, I'm sure we'll do that during the discussion, but the current era. Some of you might say, well, maybe, maybe neoliberalism. Um, maybe the Anthropocene, which has become a very sort of popular and poignant and productive um, word recently. Some who may take a slightly shorter um, time perspective might say Islamophobia or identity politics. But if I were given just one word, there's no doubt, acceleration. And acceleration has accelerated. It's been there since the beginning of modernity. Modernity is about speed, and modernity is about committing yourself to change. We can also speak a lot about the meaning of modernity. I'll also leave that to one side for now, because that would have taken more than half an hour to discuss the meanings of modernity. But let's say that modernity concerns commitment to change, acceptance of certain forms of change as being good, improvement, progress, development. And uh, the uh, Olympic motto that was devised by Coubertin when they, at the uh, outset of the first modern Olympics in 1896 in Athens was Citius Altius Fortius, faster, higher, stronger. In other words, we should improve, we should get better every time. There should be new world records at every Olympics, otherwise it's been a failure. We shouldn't be just as good as those who went before us, we should be better. And it is as if the world, since 1991, has somehow embraced the Olympic motto and turned it into a motto for the entire human world. Before I continue, I'd just like to preempt one of the obvious objections. Well, what is new about this? I mean, you know, people were complaining about information overflow and speed a long time ago. They've been doing this for a long time. And it's true that Let's say that when the first trains came, uh, the first trains in the early 19th century, all the, or many of the intellectuals at the time were concerned and they were worried about the speed with which these trains traveled and felt that this would probably be psychologically harmful for the people traveling in these trains, right? Psychologically harmful because they were so fast. And you know the average speed of a train, I mean, in the early 19th century would be maybe something like 30 kilometers an hour. But it was still much faster than the horse carriage. And, the, and the, what's interesting about this is that the horse carriage traveled at about the same speed as it would at the time of Julius Caesar. You know, so, uh, so the speed of, of transportation had been almost stable for a long time. And then all of a sudden it started to accelerate in the early 19th century. So, I mean, speed has been a, a source of anxiety for a long time. And uh, one particular form of speed that I've been especially interested in for some years I'm not going to talk a lot about that today, but I'll mention it, is to do with information, the amount of information, the feeling of information overflow. What made a rather good American journalist called Nicholas Carr to write an article in the Atlantic Monthly some years ago, which went viral, as we say nowadays. Things suddenly started to go viral. They didn't go viral in the early 90s, but they go viral now, okay? And that article was called, Is Google Making Us Stupid? And he had made the observation that he was no longer able to read a book. He was no longer capable, in fact, to read more than a couple of paragraphs before his mind started to wander and he started restlessly sort of to click on the link on his computer. So it's that kind of, that kind of uh, world in which we live. Again, how new is this? People were worrying in the 19th century as well about uh, concentration deficit. And in fact, since we are in Denmark, let me remind you that in the mid 18th century, the great, well, Dano, Norwegian, I guess we should call him, born in Bergen, lived in Copenhagen most of his life, Ludwig Holberg wrote a play called Den Stundeslöse, 
uh, The Fidget, which basically is uh, a play which makes fun of the feeling of information overflow, makes fun of information overflow. It's about a character who has so many things on his mind, and there are so many things he has to do, and they're all equally urgent that he never, that he never gets started on one of them. He never gets started at all, because there are so many things he has to do at once. And Holberg was himself quite critical in the mid-18th century of the number of books being published. He felt that there were too many books being published. It was impossible to get an overview. And besides, people spend too much time reading. Because when you read, you spend your time wandering around in other people's thoughts instead of wandering around in your own thoughts. So that could be harmful. So in other words, Critique of speed, critique of, of uh, the, the growth of information is not new. And yet, there is something which is new that I associate with, uh, let's say, the last 25 years. I'm, I'm going to move a bit back and forth in history in this lecture, but mainly it's about the last 25 years, roughly. Since 1991, when the Cold War ended in earnest, which was the year in which the new mobile phones became common, which changed the world of communication um, irreversibly. It was also the year in which the internet became commercialized, in the sense that Mr. and Mrs. Smith could now, for the first time in history, walk into a shop and buy a subscription to America Online. And they could use their internet connection, which was very slow. I mean, uh, some of us re remember that time. I mean, it was incredibly slow. And it broke off all the time, unstable and slow. But they could use it to exchange files and maybe email with people they knew. They couldn't use the internet to surf the web yet, because the web hadn't been invented. You know, it came the, well, the following year, 1992-93, the World Wide Web came. So, um, in other words, that is sort of, a, those are some of the parameters of 1991. But 1991, we could also argue, and maybe we can also discuss that afterwards, was also the year in which deregulated global neoliberal capitalism flourished across the planet. It was the end of the Cold War. A world which had until then been defined through very largely, I mean, since 1945, through the contrast, or rather the opposition, okay, between the communist countries and the Western countries. In one of those sort of groups of countries, there was a lot of security, but not a lot of freedom. You know, so, I mean, if you, if you spoke your mind, you were sent to, to, to Siberia. I mean, uh, um, in the other part, in the other half, there was lots of freedom, but there wasn't a lot of security. People felt so in insecure that in many cases they slept with a gun underneath a pillow. You know, that sort, of, that sort of world, okay? That world was now gone. And what we were left with ideologically was, in a sense, the sound of one hand clapping, that of triumphant global capitalism. Um, and the world that I am describing uh, is really a world which is produced by neoliberal, global, deregulated capitalism plus uh, information technology, enabling instantaneous global communication uh, in real time. So this is, um, uh, this, is a kind of, this is a kind of world. And uh, uh, since um, we see the same recurring patterns in lots of areas, if I had had a blackboard here, but I don't, I mean, it doesn't really matter, I can draw it in the air, okay? Um, I would have drawn an exponential curve, a curve which looks like this. And I would then have plotted various developments or various changes, accelerated changes uh, in, in the world on, 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 that, on that graph. Uh, so accelerated changes also accelerated growth, which is, I think, important to, to, to keep in mind. Um, and I'm not going to mention information technology because it's too obvious. Uh, the kind of accelerated growth we've seen in information technology. But let me mention a few other areas where we've seen accelerated change. Now, the most familiar growth curve that you have seen, which looks roughly like that, is that of population growth. And yes, it is true. It took us 200,000 years, give or take, from the time we were more or less anatomically modern, to reach the first billion. It took a long time. I mean, and humanity was on the verge of extinction many times during that period, okay? And then we finally reached the first billion. But after the first billion, it only took a little more than 100 years to reach the second. And from the second, it only took another 100 years to reach 7 billion, okay? So that's a nice sort of growth curve. And uh, um, it is about to flatten out now. But exactly how and in what way it will flatten out, uh, we still don't know. But uh, the, the growth rate uh, globally uh, has gone down, the, the percentage. But that's the most familiar one. But there are lots of things which have grown much faster than uh, population. I mean, let's take energy. 
which I'm coming back to in a little while, because that's also crucial for an understanding of modernity. I mean, some would say that, okay, modernity, it's Immanuel Kant's philosophy, or modernity is Beethoven's symphonies, or modernity is the French Revolution. But I'd say that, no, I mean, modernity is coal, you know? Coal, coal is modernity. Uh, and I'm coming back to that in a little while. But one of those uh, exponential growth curves, which moves much faster, it has, it's much steeper than that of population, is energy consumption. So world population has increased sevenfold since the Napoleonic Wars, since the end of the Napoleonic Wars, whereas uh, world energy consumption has increased by a factor of 30 in the same period. And I mean only since uh, 1980, world energy consumption has doubled. Um, and... Uh, well, if we take just one kind of energy, coal, um, coal exports have, uh, have doubled in just a little more than 10 years. Okay? So the feeling that I've sometimes had when I've been following some of these developments is that, well, I mean, uh, before I went out for a coffee, Indonesia was a fairly sort of modest uh, exporter of coal. And when I had been out and had a coffee and sort of a chat with some colleagues and came back, all of a sudden Indonesia was the world's largest exporter of coal. These things are happening fast. So a doubling of exports between 2003 and 2012 globally of coal. And that's, you know, that's narrowing it even further down than from 1991. And so energy consumption has grown by a factor of 30, largely through fossil fuels. But let's take some other, some other indications of accelerated growth. Tourism. As early as the late 1970s, there were people from Northern Europe who were complaining that Spain was now being ruined by tourism because there were too many North Europeans there. So you could walk into a cafe in Costa del Sol and get Swedish and, uh, and uh, you could walk into a football pub and meet sort of tattooed Liverpool supporters who were watching English football in a, in a pub, drinking English beer and so on and so forth. Not enough, not Spanish enough anymore somehow. But they... Have, they hadn't seen nothing yet, okay? They'd only seen the modest beginnings of mass tourism. Since around 1980, uh, world tourism, counted in the number of international tourist arrivals, has grown from 200 million to over 1 billion, okay? From 200 million to more than 1 billion in just a generation. That's fast change, isn't it? Or we could take um, the, the, the global production of waste. I don't have the global figures with me here, but I can tell you that in Norway, where we threw away lots of stuff already in 1992, when I was a young man, okay? I remember we threw away lots of stuff, and we were already complaining that we're throwing away too much good stuff. We should keep it, and we should, you know, look after our things better. And we, we don't need a new TV. We can keep the old one, and so on. We were already complaining. But again, 1992, we'd only seen the beginning. Between 1992 and the year 2010, the production of waste in Norway doubled, okay? It doubled. It went from, um, from 100% to 200%. Or I could have spoken about species extinction, the way in which human beings um, drive other species to extinction, which is also a, a line which is slightly steeper than the, that of, uh, of human population growth. Or, I mean, the last, uh, the latest statistic, I'm collecting, you see, I'm collecting these things, okay? Um, the good things about collecting that kind of figures is that they, they don't produce a lot of waste and they don't, produce, they don't take a lot of space. So I can carry them with me in my head. Um, so that's a very, very environmentally responsible way of collecting. <laughs> Instead of collecting cars, you know, I, I much, much rather prefer collecting unintentional side effects of modernity <laughs> because they're much lighter. Um, so uh, the, last, uh, the last figure I saw was just this summer. Did you know... And you probably don't, I mean, most of you probably don't, that the number of photos taken by people has trebled since 2010. It's trebled since 2010. In 2010, only 40% of the photos taken were taken with a mobile phone. By 2015, uh, the figure is estimated at something like 79%, okay? Almost a doubling of the proportion of photos taken are now taken with a mobile phone. Uh, so that's a feeling, and, and, and the number has trebled from 0 0.35 trillion to 1 trillion photos. 1 trillion photos. I mean, these, these figures are, are so mind-boggling that they don't really mean anything. So let's return to coal, and I'll then speak a little bit about growth. Um, 
coal, I say, is modernity. And in fact, the growth of the kind of world in which we live, which enable me to stand here and which enable you to sit there in a nice, cozy, warm room with electric lights and, uh, and with high tech recording the lecture and the subsequent discussion, is a child of coal. Right? The Industrial Revolution, uh, which uh, came about uh, first in, in Europe around the year 1800, give or take a few decades, flourished, blossomed in the, around the early 19, 19th century, was completely reliant on coal. And if we look at so the, the first, the oldest modern industries in the world, they are mainly located near good coal deposits. Good coal deposits in the sense of being easily accessible, like the English Midlands. Um, uh, what is now known as the Rust Belt in the United States, where there were rich coal deposits. Um, Belgium, uh, uh, the Ruhr Valley, etc. Coal deposits. Had there not been coal, the Industrial Revolution would have been called off after just a few years, because all the trees in Britain would have been gone. Right? Had, they, had they been forced to use wood, which is another form of, of stored sunlight, but which had been stored uh, much, you know, for a much shorter period of time. Coal has been stored for a long time. And as I, as I always tell people, of course, coal is renewable energy. You just have to be very patient. Because, I mean, some of this coal is 300 million years old, okay? But, I mean, if you just wait, it will come back. But you have to be patient. So it's renewable, but, um, of course, not in the same way as some other, forms of, some other forms of energy. And what has happened in the last few years in the global conversation about who we are and where we're going, if, if there is such a thing, and I believe there is, increasingly there is a global conversation, with lots of voices, some of them con contradicting each other, but often agreeing on what subjects to discuss. And what has happened somehow to the global conversation about who we are and where we're going seems to me to be that what used to be the salvation of humanity for 200 years has now quickly become our damnation namely fossil fuels. And this creates huge problems for people who talk about progress, development, etc. What, what's the salvation of humanity for 200 years? Fossil fuels, which gave us um, so many energy slaves that they're almost un un uncountable, um, which enabled the kind of world in which we live. is now becoming our damnation due to the long-term, large-scale and extremely dangerous unintentional consequences in the form of Pollution at the local level, of course, the destruction of habitats also at the local level, but at a higher level, the global level, uh, climate change. So um, this is a dilemma in which we find ourselves, and I think it's, the, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a foundational, it's a foundational story about the early 21st century, is what on earth are we going to do with this situation? How are we going to get out of the corner into which we've painted ourselves? The uh, narcotic addiction to fossil fuels and to accelerated change and to progress. Now, some might say that, well, I mean, um, yeah, but, you know, uh, they, they'll come up with something. I mean, they always did in the past. And possibly they did. But one thing is certain, and which is that growth cannot continue. Continuous growth is absurd. There is a story do I have the time to tell you? Yeah, I can tell the short version of the story. There's a story about the man who invented chess, and he also seems to have invented the exponential growth curve. Uh, and the king, who uh, had commissioned a new game, a new board game, and he was an intellectual king, he was very excited about this new game. Uh, so he told the inventor that you can have any reward you like. And the inventor said that, no, I mean, uh, your majesty, I'm a, I'm a modest man, so I only want one grain of wheat for the first square, two grains for the second, four for the third, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, tw uh, 1024, 2048, etc. And the king, relieved, said that, yeah, of course, I mean, and, and he then set his mathematicians to work on how much, how big a sack of grain this inventor should have. And as you may know, Chessboard is 8 times 8, 64 squares. And by the time they were just halfway, they realized that uh, this man, he had demanded far more wheat than the entire production of the world. 
you know, and that's the logic of a certain form of growth, which is an, a very aggressive, virulent form of growth. But even if we have a more modest form of growth, let's say a growth of 4.5% a year, which is estimated by economists as being healthy, you know, for, for a so-called developed economy, we quickly see that continued growth over a very long period is absurd. And let me give you just two examples to illustrate this. That continued growth over a very long period is absurd. And there are other objective reasons for why it is absurd also, which I'm going to mention. Um, and I've got this example from the investment banker, Jeremy Grantham, of all, of all people, who made the calculation of the possessions of Egyptians in antiquity. Suppose the, the total possessions of all Egyptians in the year 3030 before our era, before Christ, uh, amounted to one cubic meter. Okay? The entire possessions of all Egyptians in the year 3030 before Christ, one cubic meter. And, but they had economic growth. You know, they had good economists who wanted to see the black figures and not the red. So they needed growth. 4.5% okay? a year. So their possessions grew by 4.5% 4 a year until the uh, Battle of Actium in 30, 30 years before Christ. That is to say, for 3,000 years. For 3,000 years, their possessions grew by 4.5% a year. And, okay, so um, how much did they have then at the end of this sustained period of economic growth? Maybe, maybe the, their possession covered the entire surface of the Nile Delta, or maybe the entire surface of Egypt, or maybe even Egypt plus the Mediterranean. No. Um, and I'm not going to do the calculation for you because I can't, but I trust the people who've done it. Their possessions would cover 2.5 billion billion solar systems. Okay? After 3,000 years. So, I mean, good luck with growth. Uh, and I mentioned, this, I mentioned this to a colleague back home last night when I was preparing this, uh, putting the final tweaks to my presentation today. And he's a, he's a professor of economics at the Norwegian Business School. Um, and, uh, and he made his own calculation. His name is Atle Mitun. He made his own calculation. He said that, okay, if when I was 20 years old, I ate uh, 0.75 kilograms of food, 750 grams of food a day, um, my flat was 75 square kilometers, which is a good size for a flat, you know, for a single person, okay? 75 squares, no, kilometers. <laughs> 75 square meters. He had a nice sort of two or three room flat, uh, and he had one car. And he adds, he, had, he also had one wife, okay? <laughs> and if he then, if his sort of personal possessions grew by a factor of 5% a year, where would he then be at the age of 65? 5% a year. Well, he would have to eat 6.4 kilograms of food a day. Um, he would have 8.5 wives. Um, 8.5 cars, and his, he would have a flat of 641 square meters. So in other words, um, just in the space of 45 years, we already see that um, growth is, um, it, sooner or later, uh, growth is going to, to end. And it's not going to be very helpful uh, to realize that the growth that we are witnessing today is still deeply committed to fossil fuels. I mean, as I said, coal and its close relatives, uh, natural gas and oil. Um, yes, uh, there are other energy sources. And yes, they can be utilized. But so far, um, we don't see much happening in that realm. Of course, we do see it somewhere. Uh, but for the time being, there's still growth in, uh, in our consumption of fossil fuels. And the growth is really very fast. As I said, the doubling of coal exports between 2003 and 2012 testifies to this. And now that it has slowly dawned upon us that this, which used to be the recipe for success, the recipe for the good life and for progress and development, is now quickly becoming the recipe for our own disaster. We, are, um, in a, we find ourselves in a double bind. Uh, as the uh, anthropologist and system theorist Gregory Bateson calls it. A double bind, which is a, somehow a dilemma, which is a very deep dilemma, because no matter what you do, it's wrong. Think about it. No matter what you do, it's wrong. If you go for sustainability, you will create mass unemployment, and you will be, um, you will be insensitive to the needs of the poor. If you go for growth, you're insensitive to the needs of the planet and to long-term survival.
So in other words, there's no, I don't think we should believe that there is an easy way out. But this is the kind of world in which we live. A world of accelerated growth in a number of interrelated domains which creates uh, interconnections, interdependence, and very strong vulnerabilities across the planet, and to which people respond in very different ways, in different places. Um, yeah, I'm not going into those responses now, but maybe we'll do that later on. But uh, one question which is being raised is, you know, aren't things going rather well in the world. I mean, after all, we have better health. We have a higher life expectancy than ever before in history. Uh, the global middle classes are expanding. I mean, I define global middle class in a simple way. There are three criteria, okay? When do you belong to the global middle class? Okay? Um, three things. You have a TV set with a remote control. Or a computer with Netflix, I mean, in this part of the world, where, where the TV is becoming obsolete. <laughs> um, you ask yourself, what's for dinner? Or your wife, or your husband. Instead of asking, do I get anything to eat today? Throughout the history of humanity, most people have asked themselves, do I get anything to eat? So the transition from this question to the question, what's for dinner, is significant. And it signifies increased freedom, increased autonomy. And thirdly, you dream about a wonderful holiday. It could be just a weekend on the beach nearby, or it could be two weeks at a luxury resort in Thailand. That doesn't really matter. The point is that if you're there, you belong to the global middle class. And it's growing. And our life expectancy, since I mentioned, you know, I spoke about period from the Napoleonic Wars today, um, life expectancy has been doubled. And it's, we probably don't think enough about the implications of the doubling of life expectancy. Throughout humanity's history and prehistory, we lived, give or take, between 30 and 40 years, mostly. Some people grew old, but most people didn't grow old. I mean, they died of various causes. So when Beethoven died in his mid-50s of, of a disease which would today have been easy to treat, a trivial disease, that was normal. I mean, people didn't necessarily live longer than that. So, uh, and now we live until, at least in this part of the world, until we're more than 80. And many of you here are going to live to 100. As, as late as the 1920s, the American demographer, Louis Dublin, predicted that the highest average longevity you could expect in a population was 64 years. That was the highest you could get, because there were some biological um, <laughs> limitations. Now, he himself lived to, I mean, almost 90. Um, okay, but that was 64, because at the time, average life expectancy in the United States was 57, right? So, in other words, isn't there a lot to celebrate? And I, th I should say, yes, there is a lot to celebrate. But there is this feeling which is being um, somehow strengthening by all these converging tendencies that I, men uh, I, that I have mentioned, and many more. The production of waste, the consumption of energy, um, the, uh, the driving of other species to extinction, uh, the expansion of extractive industries, and the increased mobility, which again is also bad news for the climate. Uh, the convergence of all of these tendencies leads us to somehow being reminded of something we used to say to each other in the 1970s out of ignorance, but which may now perhaps be said with some more substantial um, knowledge, namely that we are standing on the edge of a cliff and about to take a long step forward. <coughs> so, uh, in other words, um, we need to do something. The question is, what? And the jury is out on this. Or rather, there are several juries with different bids as to what we should do. One family of uh, approaches to the dilemma in which humanity finds itself, um, and to many of us, I mean, the least attractive, but it's worth taking seriously. We should take all these options seriously, okay? Nobody has the answer. But maybe many people have a small bit of the answer. One school holds that we need to stop having children and consume less, <laughs> okay? At least stop having as many children, because there are too many of us. Stop having children and consume less. The Malthusian approach, you know, Thomas Malthus, um, who wrote, interesting enough, his essay on the principle of population just at the beginning of the exponential population growth that we've seen in the last 200 years. And Malthus's view was that um, 
um, pr food production would not be able to keep up with population growth. And he saw an exponential growth curve, what he called geometrical growth in population, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, whereas food production, he said, uh, grows arithmetically, 1, 2, 3, 4. Malthus was um, viciously attacked by Marx and Engels, who spoke of him you know, disparagingly as the baboon Malthus and other things, uh, for not having understood that if the productive uh, apparatus changes, the means of production change, technology improves, um, you will be able to support far more people than what he thought. And up until now, Marx and Engels have been right. But one wonders if Malthus will get the final word sometime during the 21st century. So that is, the, that is one, one take on this. Um, the um, idea that we must reduce population and consume less and sit still, you know, when, uh, when, you, when, you, when you don't move around, you use less energy, right? When you just sit still and do nothing. <laughs> As a friend of mine often says, don't just do something, sit there. <laughs> and uh, uh, so that's, you know, slow, uh, a form of slowness. Um, Another solution uh, which is being promoted by a family of e economists is degrowth. Simply trying to devise economic models which do not presuppose growth. It's, uh, in, the, in the economic sciences, this is easier said than done. But there are people who are working on it. A third option, which is popular, not least among some anthropologists, because anthropologists are, um, have a, we have a weakness for uh, diversity. And, for, and uh, we also have a professional obligation to, um, to look beyond our own little goldfish bowl in search for solution. Uh, namely, the search for solutions to the ecological problems in indigenous peoples and their practices, which are often sustainable. Now, one question is, why are they sustainable? Is it because they just lack technology? I mean, would they have been just as bad as everybody else, have they? Maybe not. And there is an interesting ideological movement in South America called Buen Vivir, Buen Vivir, Good Living, which posits an alternative to the sort of the Western um, view of the good life based on consumerism um, and the destruction of nature, um, basing their worldview on um, received knowledge and insight uh, into life and the relationship between humans and the non-human surroundings that we are part of from indigenous groups. Um, a third, oh no, a fourth, fourth, sorry about that, getting out of order. The fourth alternative to the current situation could be that uh, posited by um, a movement which is incipient, that which is sort of bubbling just below the surface now and which will probably flourish in the next few years called eco-modernity, eco-modernity, which at first glance looks like an attempt to eat your cake and have it too. In other words, we can continue to prosper and to lead middle-class lives and to include all the Chinese and all the Indians and everybody else in the middle-class life, only that we have to make a switch uh, from our sources of energy, in our sources of energy, from fossil fuels to other things, to sustainable, renewable, or maybe not so renewable energy. The reason I'm saying not so renewable is that thorium and uh, uranium are among those energy sources that may keep industry going without destroying the climate. Um, okay, so these are some of the see, these are some of the alternatives. Um, now that I, as I round off, where do I think we should go? I'm sure we can discuss this at great length later on, and I do not want to posit any authoritative answers. The only thing I'm saying is that the, this is a big question. This is a big question facing humanity. The big question is not about Islamophobia or about the future of the European Union. The big question is not even about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. You know, that huge area of plastic sludge which covers the size of Texas. Um, outside, out, out in the Pacific. It, it's not about those things. It's about much larger. It's a much larger question than that, uh, which is about a sustainable climate capable of keeping us alive um, in in the foreseeable and perhaps even non-foreseeable future. Well, we need clearly to think in a new way. First of all, we need to revitalize that old idea uh, that we some of us remember from from a previous period of environmentalists of spaceship Earth, spaceship Earth. In other words, uh, 
the resources are limited, okay? The resources in, in the world are limited. And that needs to be a premise for politics and for economics and for planning and for human action. Are, uh, resources are limited. In other words, we should all know where our stuff comes from and where it's going afterwards. Right? Um, that's one. Um, the, 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 the myth of unlimited good, which we still see in, um, in some parts of economic and political thinking, needs to be debunked. Secondly, we should probably or I should say we should surely shift towards what anthropologists often these days speak of as a human economy. An economy which is based on the assumption that the reason that we do things, the reason that we produce and consume things, is not to generate profits but to satisfy human needs. Which in turn are often culturally defined. Everybody knows this, children know this, but they pretend to have forgotten it when they grow up. That what means, what, what matters, and that's my sort of a corollary to the uh, human economy. What matters to human beings is not the amount of stuff you've got, it's your relationship to other people. Everybody knows it, but we pretend to have forgotten it. So in other words, um, a human economy based on the satisfaction of human needs and human needs which are under, properly understood and not on generating profits. Relationships, not things. And um, thirdly, from this it follows that we should probably think about economy, or rather about the market sphere, um, as ideally having cheap services and expensive goods. Things should be expensive and services should be cheaper. So that it makes sense, for example, to have your jacket fixed, you know, when it tears, okay? I, I, I bring my jackets sometimes to have them fixed and then the guy says, he just shakes his head and says that it, it would be much cheaper for you just to buy a new one. And I mean, a friend of mine who bought a scanner, a fairly cheap scanner, okay? And it didn't work quite as well as he had hoped when he got home. There were some sort of stripes, okay, on the, uh, on the, on the scans. And he rang them up and said, uh, I just bought a scanner from you. Can I come to you and have it fixed? It doesn't work properly. And they said, did you keep the receipt? I said, well, yeah, I got the receipt. Well, then you just throw it away and come here with the receipt and we'll give you a new one. Knowing that it's cheaper to have a new scanner produced in China and transported from China to Oslo than just turning on the meter for a repair in Oslo. And, you know, I don't want to live in that kind of world. I don't think it's moral or <laughs> it's, it's not sustainable. It's, you know. So, cheap services and expensive things. And finally, the entire idea of development needs to be renovated. What exactly, is what exactly is development? What do, we, what do we think about when we say development? Probably we should think about human development and probably, and not only probably, certainly we should think about human development as being ecological, sustainable, and uh, long-term viable. There is a challenge here for progressive politics, which remains and which has not been solved, and I'm not saying that I have the solution, but I'm now, towards the end of this talk, posing the problem. The problem for progressive politics is that progressive politics has, for several hundred years, mainly dealt with inequality and addressing problems to do with inequality. And to some extent, issues to do with technological development, right? Idea of progress. And thirdly, democracy, right? Participation, democratic participation. We are now at this juncture. We're faced with two other uh, areas. And this is what the overheating research project is about, as, as Nils Buman pointed out in his introduction. Um, yes, the economy, distribution, inequality, financialization, virtualization of the economy, which is a big, big topic in itself. But we have two other um, big uh, fields of politics which are not going away and which traditionally have not been dealt with by the same people that have been concerned with inequality. And one of them is multiculturalism and cultural diversity. Diversity as being something which somehow is valuable in itself and which cannot be reduced to inequality because it's qualitative difference. And that, is a, that is, remains the dilemma, not least in the European left. And thirdly, questions to do with uh, sustainability and ecology. Where all of a sudden uh, an entirely sort of new way of looking at the world is brought in and brought to the forefront and which can be hard to reconcile. 
the politics of inequality can be hard to reconcile with the politics of identity and with that of green thinking. So in other words, we have a job to do here. I'll now define what I see as some of the premises and what we can be certain of is that in the near future, or I'd say now, or I should have said last week, or last year, what we need more than anything is a methodology of hope, intellectual daring, and political imagination. So I thank you for your attention and thanks for being here. Thank you.